now now we're at the four ninety five persons uh, here. Okay, welcome everyone to this important talk on prostate cancer. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer, the Oren Europharma, for organizing this talk. Prostate, prostate cancer is such a common cancer. It's the third commonest in Malaysia in men. Now with all the with the traditional treatment and the new treatment modalities, I'm actually getting outdated. So I'm really looking forward to this talk by our two prominent eminent speakers. What do I want to learn from the two speakers? Well, I'd like to know who can be operated on, what about when is robotic come into play, and about all this treatment mortality, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, target therapy, immunotherapy, and the different approaches to local, localized and metastatic cancer. I'm sure all this info will be useful to all the non-urologists here. Then there's always the old problems of how to interpret PSA level. Of course, it is easy just to refer everyone to the urologist, but it's nice to know a bit more about this interpretation of the PSA level again. So with this introduction, I'm going to start our talk by introducing our first speaker. The first speaker is a consultant urologist currently at Noma Medical Center. He's an adjunct professor of UNIMAS as well, past president of Malaysia Urological Associations and examiner for the Royal College of Edinburgh, Glasgow, and the Malaysia Board of Urology. He has a lot on his official CV, which I don't have uh, time to mention then all. Now I want to present this speaker uh, about how I know him at a personal level. The speaker is my mentor. Not only he taught me about urology, but also life philosophy. In 1994, when I first came back from UK, I knew no one. And when I met the sixth speaker at his lecture, he just brought me to KLGH for a week, teaching me urology, introduced me to Malaysia medical professions. What a warm reception by someone whom I met for the first time at a lecture. Then I remember once, I was talking with him at Tanama's Hotel in Cebu after work. Then we talk about, how, about racing kicks. He was quiet, listened to me the whole evening. The next day, he sent me a book which he wrote about guidebooks for parents. Wow. So our next speaker is not only an expert urologist, but also a life guru as well. So with that, please help me to welcome the one and only Dr. Clarence Lay. And he has 25 minutes for his talk and we can have the questions at the end of the two speakers' speeches. Thank you. Over to you, Clarence. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Clement Chen. It's, it's such a big honor for me to speak to all my colleagues. I can see now we've got 107 uh, wow. participants. I think many of you are actually my fellow colleagues. We manage the patients together. So it's a big honor to me for, you to sh for me to share uh, today's lecture. Um, can I share my screen now? Let me see, share screen. Uh, there, this will stop other sharing screen. Okay, can I stop the housekeeping? All right. So that is my lecture. I have already pre-run this lecture just now with Dr. Tay. So we, we, uh, we more or less know what we're going to talk about. And what I'm going to give you is just an overview uh, of this gland here called the prostate gland, the most troublesome gland for men. Uh, so we have to learn how to cope with it. And, uh, and later on, 
uh, Dr. Tay will discuss more about the treatment in the garment, about treatment options, about trials, and then later on, I really hope that we'll get feedback uh, from the team, uh, the urology team and all of us. So prostate cancer is very common cancer. It's slow growing, but it can kill you. So I'm gonna give you some data from the local scene uh, from, from my electronic records. I think many of you know that I keep, I keep electronic records. I keep a personal registry of many of the common diseases. And all of you, well, most of you are involved in managing them somehow, like, not because Sarawak is a big place. And, um, and, and many of these patients are co-managed with uh, orthopedics, with general surgeons, with family doctors. And I will talk a little bit about prostate cancer management, mostly on advanced cancer, the types of therapy. Uh, Mr. Te will, will elaborate on them. Uh, most of the prostate cancers in, in Malaysia, especially in Sarawak, they are advanced cancer. So there's a median survival of three to four years. And then of course, we'll try to answer the chairman's question. What is new? What can give you a better outcome? What are the new tests we can do? I'll just mention them, but the details will come from Dr. Tay's lecture, okay? The, the new PET scan, the new MRI, and then the personalized medicine. Everybody said we can do this molecular test. We can do this genetic testing. We can give this new treatment. Not only we can give the new treatment, we give it earlier. And then you have an effect on survival. And then, then there are so many talks that are, that are sponsored by Big Pharma. They'll analyze it and say, oh, this will give you a survival of how many months or how many years. But we have to weigh that in terms of cost. I think cost is a very important issue in Sarawak. And we're not talking about cost of a few hundred ringgit, we're talking about a few thousand dollars. And then the, the, the problems with this medication, you know, the prostate gland is actually a sexual organ. So if whatever treatment will have effect on the sexual function. And then the side effects, fatigue, cognitive function, many of them cause a rash of some sort. Not even the COVID vaccine <laughs> cause a rash now, right? So, so this basically, this is the outline of my lecture. I should finish by 6.30. Okay, the first slide is to show you how common is prostate cancer. I can confess I'm 65. I'm, I may not be the oldest in the audience. I think there are a few people older than me in the audience. I'm 65. So if I die today for whatever reason, and you do a postmortem on me, the chance of me having prostate cancer uh, is, well, green, uh, green, I'm Asian. Uh, so it's about 60%. So it is a very, very common post-mortem diagnosis in men, in men. It is a cancer that every man will get if they, if they live long enough. And then now we know genetic is very important. Genetic, or some people say metabolic or environment or whatever. No, it's not just the cancer itself. Uh, so if, if you have a family history of young cancers, prostate cancers, breast cancer, your relative relative is more than seven. But if you go to some hospitals, including normal hospital for executive health screening, PSA will not be in the list. Okay, not in the list. Then are we negligent now? We didn't do the PSA. So I showed this to Dr. Lim Joo Kyung and he said, well, Clarence, a lot of these things depend on the absolute risk. What is the absolute risk? We, we have the absolute risk of about 9.3% of all cancers are prostate. So in Malaysia, we have about 2,000 prostates per year. I was just talking to Dr. Clement Chen just now. We only have 100 urologists. I don't think the urologists are seeing 200 patients a year, 200 prostate patients a year. So most of these patients will be managed in the community with those who are attending, the, attending this webinar. It is the third commonest cancer uh, in, 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 in among, among, among all, all uh, by, by sex, by sex, among all, all residents in Malaysia. I look at my data. I, use, I like to keep data, keep registries. And when the, when the National Cancer Registry started in Malaysia in 1987, my boss, Dr. Carola, the wife was in charge of it. So I have to collect all the data religi religiously. And in that year, there were only 22 cases. That means we see about two new cases per, per month. And almost all of them are metastatic disease. At that time, we didn't even do the grading for the, doing you do a proper grading for the cancer. We just diagnosed cancer. And when I look at my early, early personal registry uh, in private practice, I also see about one case every two months. And most of the time they report low grade, low grade cancer, but they all treat it alike. But now, nowadays grading is considered very important and the treatment is different. So we started the Malaysian uh, urological conference every year. And so we got data coming produced by the trainees. Now this, I think this is from Dr. Tay himself uh, in 1998. 1998. So, so we, we begin to see 
more patients with prostate cancer, older patients, and the, the incidence of advanced cancer has dropped to 61.8%, but most of them still receive just an orchidectomy. So now look at the personal series, so-called personal series, but actually I combination them with everybody, la, everybody. Uh, uh, so so I, I just stopped two days ago. I had 186 cases since 1998. Most of them are the older age group. The youngest patient was 43 years old. In fact, this patient, I didn't even see him. The grandfather was my patient. So he contacted me, sent me all his reports, and he had actually high volume disease, all the 12 cores and high grade disease. The highest grade is five, la, so he got five in most of the biopsies, four plus five. So now, we, we, now the pathologists look at both two parts of the biopsy. Uh, so most of them are sort of older, 60 plus, la. I don't know whether they consider me older or not. Uh, we have now seven urologists in Sarawak, and we have the Sarawakian surgeons, we have the private doctors. So actually it's a lot of teamwork to look after, especially during the pandemic, con uh, pandemic COVID pandemic. Nah. Not so many intonations, you know, even way back in 98, I, we don't have that many Indonesians in my hospital. Only two Caucasians, uh, they're expatriate workers. Uh, so most of these are local people, local people. I, I managed to finish half of the cases. I looked at half of the cases, uh, the, the, the more recent ones. Uh, and the PSA, all of them are really very high, very high PSAs, uh, high PSAs. And in fact, four of them got PSAs in the thousands. Uh, and also quite a few of them are not even biopsy because they're all, you know, so the, the diagnosis is based on the PSA, the DRE, the ultrasound, the CD scan. And later on, Dr. Tay will talk about biops, the different biopsies and what is the risk of the each biopsy. So what about the treatment? So I look at my cases. As a urologist working mostly in private, we can initiate them on treatment. So this is the initial treatment. What happened to them in the end? Many of the patients are lost to follow up. They go to the GH, they go to the family doctor or they are too elderly. So it's a, it's a problem for me to look at retrospectively follow up data. Like how many could call them? You know what happened to your grandfather? He's still alive. You know so and some of them because incomplete data. So most of them you receive what is called ADT, anti anti androgen therapy. Most of them, some of them receive radical prostatectomy, uh, either in in in, a, in Sarawak Hospital or in Care or in Singapore. Two of them have open prostatectomy. One has got the laparoscopic prostatectomy. And now with COVID nineteen, most of the OTs in Malaysia, I think are not really functioning full swing. So you can ask Dr. Te, what's going to happen to all these patients with early prostate cancer? Uh, orchidectomy, not so popular, not so popular. Rare therapy, also not so popular. Now, once you remove the testes surgically or medically, they, you induce the menopause. So all of them requires extra calcium, vitamin D, sunlight, exercise. And not many patients are taking the so-called bone agents. Eh? Bone agents. Uh, not many patients are following what the the euro oncologists are recommending. We not many patients are actually on upfront chemotherapy or upfront new agents. Only three patients are on the new agents. Huh? Only three patients. Family history, not that common. Not that common. Only sixteen of them. Uh, but now more and more we're looking into it. Like, we're looking into it to see whether we can have a group of patients where we can personalize the treatment. Uh, preferably, they should have confirmation by biopsy. Like. To me, I think I still do a DRE. To me, is to me DRE is very relevant. Very important to me. Uh, we talk about DRE in the next slide. PSA is important. X-ray is important. CT scan is okay. So this is the this is the transrectal ultrasound. Huh? It gives you a better picture than abdominal ultrasound. So usually we biopsy by the transrectal route. But you know the rectum is not exactly the clean organ. Huh? So you can get a severe sepsis. And, uh, and uh, if you do too many prostate biopsies, then they can also have another problem, which is often not recognized. They of sexual dysfunction. And transrectal, we cannot tackle the anterior and the apical. So now in many places, they move to transperineal biopsy, uh, usually under an anesthetic, although I know that we are starting to do it under local anesthetic. And then we send them in different pots. Uh. Usually we think of biopsy, we can send in one pot, but now we send in, we can send it in six pots. We can, and now we add one more for genetic testing, we send in seven pots. And all this add up. And you can also do MRI, you can also do transrectal ultrasound. So a prostate biopsy in Malaysia can cost anything from 3,000, not 3 ringgit, huh? 3 ringgit. I think even government is cost more than 3 ringgit. 3,000 to 30,000, depending, depending on how you do, what you do, and where you send the biopsy. Most of them are adenocarcinoma, like, although we have one patient with neuroendocrine. So these are the patients with uh, prostate cancer, but PSA is not very high, huh? not very high, only PSA of 40. 
Now, if you look at the new studies, you go to the internet and look, they put a lot of emphasis on the Gleason score. Gleason score is the, 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 the grading. The grading is based on the cytology and the architecture. Architecture. So when I look at my 100 over cases, I look at the biopsy reports, actually there's a lot of interpathologies, uh, you know, uh, difference. And so I personally don't find it to be very useful. I don't find the Gleason score for the, my retrospect, retrospective studies to be useful. And also it depends on the predominant grade. Now, if, if they've got more grade four, more grade five, then they are in the higher risk group. So this is one way of, of giving the risk. Uh, so we know that prostate cancer is very common. It's ranked, ranked as number seven, but not all of them die. No, in terms of death, it's only number 13. At least unlike lung cancer, you know, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, liver cancer, many of them do die. So how do we pick out which are the ones who don't die or, do we, or should we diagnose it earlier? Earlier on, I alluded that in Malaysia, prostate cancer is often diagnosed as stage four. Stage four, quite often in Malaysia. So you can say like Malaysia, you know, Malaysia boleh country, blah, blah, blah. But actually, if you look at the Asian developed countries, Korea, eh, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, this I consider them developed countries. They also have a very high incidence of advanced cancer at presentation. So don't feel too guilty if you have been a family doctor for many years for this patient and suddenly one day his PSA is 1,000 and the, the doctor call you up, oh dear doctor, how come I, my father got prostate cancer? You never diagnosed it earlier. But I personally think that many of these cancers appear de novo. They just certainly appear and they're advanced stage already. They are different. Now, but do we actually miss, if a patient got prostate cancer, do we miss the, the diagnosis of prostate cancer? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. So this patient was sent to me by Dr. Chong Hong He. I, I believe he's logged in already. So he sent me this patient. Uh, this patient called leg edema. So leg edema, go and see a GP. Unfortunately, la, don't, I don't think all the GPs are like that. GP gives Lasix, la. leg swelling gives Lasix. Still not better. Then he goes to Nocturia. So he see a garment doctor, Clinica Seatan. Oh, Clinica Seatan. Oh, sorry, my presence is spelled wrongly. Clinica Seatan uh, must be prostate. La. Give, give some alpha blocker. La. Still not better. Then he came back to me to see his trusted family doctor, Dr. Chong. And uh, he ran a profile and did a director examination. And of course, this patient has got uh, extensive prostate cancer causing, going to the bone, going to the limb nodes, hydronephrosis. So what is the role of a digital rectal examination? I, I think some of you in the, who are more senior in the audience will know like this, this is uh, Chua Chou Meng. Chua Chou Meng is the, he is the longest serving minister of health. I don't know who is going to be our new minister of health. So we decided to teach him to do DRE, DRE, digital rectal examination, because it's so important. But let me tell you, DRE is not comfortable for the patient, not comfortable for the doctor. So, 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 so it doesn't mean that you have to do a DRE for every patient, but if you suspect a cancer prostate, or if you're not going to refer the patient, I think doing a DRE is quite useful, like quite useful. You can feel the heart nodule, irregular prostate, craggy heart prostate, or at least you do a PSA, like do a PSA. So, so if a high PSA, like this is a study done in Taiwan. I, I, try, I always show this study when I, when I show the PSA to my, to my patients. Now. Above 50, almost certainly a prostate cancer. In Malaysia, Dr. Savalingam published in 2001 from our multiple prostate awareness data. It's, in Malaysia, it's only 77.9. So it may be that the race PSA in Malaysia is due to other reasons like trauma or, or infection. infection. So, so, so we still continue to miss prostate cancer. So try not to miss prostate cancer. Now, what is the treatment? I put it very briefly, okay? The next five minutes, I tell you about treatment, but Dr. Tay will elaborate. And of course you can have the, our, our recording uh, later on if you want to have more details. So the most important treatment is to withdraw the male hormone. How to withdraw the hormone? Remove the testicle. It's cheap, it's permanent, and it's still the best in many social economic, especially in East Malaysia, even in the year 2021. So I did not get a Nobel prize for, for doing this. This guy did. So Professor Huggins got a Nobel Prize for discovering that by removing the testicle and giving them anti-androgens, the, the, the prostate cancer is, is well controlled, but it induces a menopause, you've got erectile dysfunction, you get hot flushes, you got cognitive problem, you got osteoporosis, you get metabolic syndrome, you may have a higher risk of heart attacks, you may have higher risk of uh, diabetes, and you may have fractures, so you have to encourage them to exercise. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, have some sunlight, although I don't know how effective sunlight is for vitamin D. Sometimes they are given bone agents, which to me are quite expensive, and the bone agents can cause a serious side effect of osteonecrosis of the jaw. 
Now, many of these patients who are receiving antiandrogen therapy are not getting uh, orchidectomy, but they are receiving one of these injections, okay? Which the idea is to block the release of releasing hormone to the testicle. So it's a, it's a GH, RH antagonist like this one, Pamagon. It works almost immediately and it's supposed to be less cardiotoxic, like less cardiotoxic as compared to the GH, RH agonist, which many of you will be giving. Uh, there are so many of them, uh, Lucrine, Eligat, Pomeranin, and then Zolodex. And it comes in different preparations. Some of them, like the COVID vaccine, you have to store them in ice, two to eight, and you have to mix it very quickly. And there's a way to mix it. And you must give it immediately because otherwise it becomes a cake, become a cement cake, you know? Uh, and of course, there are different strengths depending on what is the strength. You can, give, you can use for one month, for three months, and six months, and different formulation. Although they have the same generic product, can also come at different strength, uh, different strength. So this one, Elicat is 32.5. If you look at the uh, Lucrine, it is, it is uh, 11.25. You include Zolodex, is 10.8. This one is Pamorelin. Uh, uh, so I have to spend a bit of time on this because they sponsor today's talk. Uh, today's talk. Uh, so it comes with a powder. You have to mix it and you have to inject it very quickly. And of course, the price. There's a price. Huh? There's a price. There's a price there. Okay. Now, this slide is from our sponsor. I must, this is uh, my declaration, huh? declaration. There are so many of them. Which one is most effective? In terms of effectiveness of control of the testosterone, uh, triptorelin is the most effective. Huh? Most effective as compared to lupralide and gusarelin. Okay. Then the, med the medical castration. Medical castration. You can give injection, you can give, if it doesn't work, it becomes castrate resistant. Then you can give them secondary antiandrogens, but they are very expensive. So, so, so you can consider chemotherapy, but you know the Asian population don't like chemotherapy so much. Huh? Okay, now what about other therapy? We know that if, if you are Japanese in Japan, the chance of dying from prostate cancer is much less than you, if you are an American or if you are Japanese staying in Hawaii. So there must be some other factors and of course, the patients will go to the internet. They will buy all these uh, supplements, special dietary, soybean-based products, whatever. I think there's some truth in that. Huh? Some truth in that. And which are the patients you select for, for, for more aggressive therapy? Okay, so we talk about Gleason score, which is not useful for retrospective study. It also depends on your pathologies and other things depend on your PSA level and of course the stage that the stage. Now I come to this important topic about genetics. This was popularized by Angelina Jolie. Like she had both her breast removed uh, and also her ovary removed uh, because she was carrying the gene, uh, the genetics, okay? So now for prostate biopsies and for many biopsies, uh, not only the prostate, like ovary, breast, pancreas, if there's a strong family history of young cancer, then we can also do a genetic study. And this genetic study at the present moment it's of course another 1005, 1005. So it's extra, and you have to send extra tissue, or you can also give uh, give uh, also give histology from the from the previous tissue, like from the previous tissue, and also imaging. There are many other new imaging which Dr. Tay will elaborate about, but you listen very carefully, and you see at the end for our discussion, we can see is this available in Sarawak? Is it affordable? And in terms of quality of life, you know, you know, is it is it worth the while? So, so I know that the, the Sarawak urology team, we have a thing called the Sarawak urology team. There are about 20 of us throughout Sarawak. So I, I know they're locked in. So later on at the end during Q&A, we can discuss that. Uh, we can discuss. Thank you very much.